All right, guys, we've got a rainy day here in Jacksonville today, but we're gonna go hit a back workout anyway. I'm gonna make a run for the car. Let's get it. So guys, uh, what I decided I'd do is a quick Q&A video. So I got a ton of questions. I think there was over 5,000 comments on my million subscribers video. So thanks for all the amazing comments, all the support and all the great questions. I was actually really impressed with the caliber of questions that you guys asked. Um, so what I did was I went through and tried to pick the ones that got a nice few upvotes so that um, th there were at least questions that you guys probably wanted to hear me talk about. So I picked 16 uh, out of the 5,000 that I just screenshot as I was going through the, the top comments there. And I'm gonna answer eight in this video and then I'm gonna answer the next eight in another video. And we're on the way to the gym right now to hit a back workout. So I'll just overlay some of the clips from the back workout and answer you guys questions. So I'll check in with you guys over at the gym. All right, so guys, what I decided I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sip on my Kiwi Lime Prolific pre-workout here and uh, answer my questions as I sip on this and then uh, get into the workout after it. So we'll overlay the clips of the workout as I answer the questions. And yeah, let's dig into it. Okay, first question. How do you find motivation to go to the gym when having a bad day? Um, so for me, I basically set up a rule for myself that I'm just simply not gonna skip the gym because I'm having a bad day. And I think that this really speaks to the importance of having a training program that you can adhere to. I find if you're just totally freestyling it, you'll be so much more likely to have that temptation to skip. But if you can build trust in yourself that you're actually gonna stick to your program and get to the gym over time, then it just becomes less and less likely that you're gonna skip a workout um, just because you're having a bad day, which I don't think is a good excuse not to get to the gym. Now, one thing I used to do earlier on in my training career was I used to put a lot of pressure on myself to perform to my best ability even when I was having a bad day. Uh, but over time, I've realized that it's just perfectly normal for progress to wax and wane. You're gonna have good days, you're gonna have bad days. And if you're having a bad day, you should just accept that, continue to stick to the program and get all the work in. But if your lifts aren't necessarily as good as they would be on a good day, then you shouldn't beat yourself up about that and realize that you're gonna bounce back and get back to where you were anyway. And interestingly, I found that on days where I feel the worst going into the gym, those often end up being the best workouts for me. And sometimes when I feel amazing going to the gym, I'm feeling hyped and everything, uh, the weight just for whatever reason ends up feeling really heavy. So how you're feeling going into the workout isn't always a good predictor of how that workout ends up actually going. Um, so you wanna keep that in mind. And like I said, build trust in yourself and your ability to follow through on the program. And you'll be so much more successful over the long term. Hopefully that helps. Okay, question number two. What is the optimal amount of muscle mass relative to weight for health? And is there a point where gains in muscle have a negative effect? Okay, so I think that, this is an interesting question. So I think that most of the health benefits that we see from working out are a result of resistance training itself and the gains in strength that you see from that, not necessarily the gains in muscle mass themselves per se. That's kind of just my opinion on it. I don't really have any research to support that, but. I feel like all the benefits in terms of improved bone mineral density, uh, better joint and ligament health, um, better strength, uh, prevention of, of strength loss as you age or muscle loss as you age tend to come from just getting stronger, which is great from a general health perspective. And um, then you do have all these other peripheral health benefits like uh, improved insulin sensitivity, um, even improved cardiovascular health uh, from lifting weights. So there are a ton of positive health effects that come from resistance training and I would say that there probably isn't a point where you'll build so much muscle naturally that it starts to have a negative effect. Those negative effects usually come from steroid abuse where you've built so much muscle that your heart just has to work so hard to pump all the blood throughout your system uh, that it ends up usually resulting in heart problems for people who've abused steroids for a long time. But I just don't think it's possible to build that much muscle naturally. So as a good rule of thumb, I would say the more muscle that you can carry naturally, probably the better, unless it results in also a really high body fat percentage. Now, one thing that I think a lot of people get confused about on this is that they assume that because someone looks very fit or very aesthetic, it necessarily means that they're healthier. And I would say it probably is true as a general rule of thumb. Like if someone looks fitter, they're probably healthier than the average sedentary person. But uh, on the flip side, I know a lot of fit people who look very aesthetic and muscular who actually aren't very healthy, and that usually comes as a result of being excessively lean. Um, so for men, for example, when you get below, let's say eight to 10% body fat, you start to run into all kinds of health complications, 
like low testosterone and then psychological issues like body image dysmorphia is really, really common as you get leaner. And with women, it's probably even worse. As you get really lean, uh, you can get amenorrhea, reduced mo bone mineral density, increased risk of osteoporosis, and all kinds of bad stuff. Um, so just because you're lean doesn't necessarily mean you're healthy if it gets to the point that it's excessive. When it comes to uh, really high levels of muscle mass, another potential issue is overtraining to the point that it leads to injury or just overtraining in general. And I do see that in people who are really, really adamant about maximizing their muscle growth. Um, but when you keep moderation in mind, I would say that on the whole, weight training and building muscle is very positive for health and I wouldn't say that there's a point where that starts to turn negative until you turn to steroids or if you just get overly obsessed with exercising in general. All right, question three, can you do a video addressing rest times and how they change depending on how your training changes? Um, so I actually already did a video on rest times but not a lot of people saw it because it was a fundamentals whiteboard video. Um, so I will quickly address this again because it did get a lot of upvotes. I think the main thing you wanna keep in mind with rest periods is how it fits into the context of what's really fundamental for driving muscle growth. Um, so we know that volume is really important. There's a dose-response relationship between volume and hypertrophy, meaning the more volume you do up to a point, the more muscle growth you'll see. And we don't really know where that point is yet. Uh, we also know that progressive overload is very important for growth, so you need to be presenting a new and increased stressor to your body over time, whether that's increasing weight or uh, sets or uh, progressively getting better at form or whatever. And then we also know that there's a threshold of effort or intensity that you need to reach because it doesn't really matter how much volume you're doing or how well you're progressively overloading if you're not training hard at all. And that's probably somewhere around like an RP of seven or eight. So you do need to train hard and that matters. So what we need to think about is how do rest periods fit into the context of those more important acute training variables. And I would say that as a general rule, if you're resting not long enough, so if, you're, if your rest periods are too short between sets, then you're probably not gonna be recovered to the point that you're gonna be able to handle the same amount of weight, and so your volume is gonna be diminished as a result. By the same token, if you're resting too long between sets, your workouts can get really dragged out, and then you might not have the same amount of energy to put into your sets toward the end of your workout, and the intensity may be lowered, right? Um, so I think that, as a general rule, a sweet spot is probably around one to two minutes of rest between sets that have, let's say, six to 15 reps which should be the majority of your work if your primary goal is hypertrophy. For pure strength work, so stuff under, let's say six reps, you'll wanna rest a little bit longer because they generally take a little longer to recover from. Uh, so something like, let's say three to four minutes or maybe as high as five minutes if you're doing a really heavy set. And then for the really high rep stuff, I still generally don't recommend resting under one minute because all the research that we have tends to show better hypertrophy in uh, groups that train with longer rest periods or with rest periods longer than one minute. All right, next question. Do you think advice like cardio kills gains is taken to the extreme by people who want an excuse not to do cardio, thereby affecting their cardiovascular health? And what is the amount of cardio that can be optimally incorporated into a bodybuilding routine for health benefits, even if it slightly affects gains? Okay, those are two, those are two really good questions. And this is a little bit of a controversial area, so I'm gonna share my opinion on it. Um, before I do that, actually, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna dig up the American Heart Association recommendations for cardio here. Give me two seconds. So, okay, I'll put this up out here on the screen as well. So the AHA, uh, as of 2015, recommends at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity at least five days per week for a total of 150 minutes or 25 minutes uh, of more vigorous activity three days per week. However, I would say that those recommendations are generally being made for an average sedentary population, and I don't think they take into account a lot of specific individual scenarios. So in 2010, Alan Aragon wrote a really great piece about the crossover between resistance training and its effect on cardio metabolic outcomes. One really important takeaway is that how much cardio you should do for health really depends on all of these lifestyle factors. So let's say you work a job in agriculture, right? Where you're gonna be really, really active. Your levels of NEAT or non-exercise activity thermogenesis, so how many calories you burn apart from formal exercise is gonna be really high. Um, so one study found it was higher than 2,000 calories per day just from these, this extra NEAT, right? Uh, whereas if you work a desk job, you might only burn off uh, you know, 200 or 300 calories 
due to fidgeting or whatever, in which case you might need more formal cardio to get the same benefits, right? Um, the same thing goes for resistance training. If you're doing a very high volume, say high rep resistance training program, you're gonna reap a lot of cardiometabolic effects from that on its own and may not need as much formal cardio. Um, so like almost any issue when it comes to health, the real answer is gonna be that it depends. Uh, when it comes to me personally, I'll probably walk for about a half an hour, probably two to three times per week. I find that's actually helped with my lower back as well, um, and it helps keep me a little bit more in shape and able to handle, handle volume. Um, and then I'll probably just play a game of pickup basketball probably once or twice a week as well, and that's about it. Now to address the second part of this question, which is basically how much cardio can you get away with without <laughs> losing gains, that's another really good question, and that also really depends. Um, it's actually really well documented in the literature that at the molecular level, there is an observed interference effect between the pathway that drives endurance adaptations and the pathway that drives muscular growth. So they do seem to interfere at a fundamental level. However, when you kind of zoom out to the human scale, uh, it seems to depend on a whole bunch of other factors. And there are tons of examples of really impressive, true hybrid athletes like Alex Viata is a really good example, who have incredible endurance and also incredible strength. So it's, I think, more so a matter of the fact that your programming has to get more intricate and complicated as you start to get more and more advanced on both of those modalities. What, what it really comes down to is that whether or not your cardio is gonna interfere with your muscle progress, uh, it, it ultimately comes down to three main factors. So frequency, duration, and mode. So the more often that you do cardio, the more likely it is to interfere. For me, I try to keep it to two or three times a week. Uh, the longer it lasts, it's more likely to interfere. And how much impact it has is another factor. So running seems to have a greater interference with muscle growth than say cycling or swimming. Um, so in general, you wanna keep cardio to an effective minimum and you don't want it to last too long and you want to choose modes of cardio that have lower impact. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that answers that. Next question. All right, all right. How does flexibility affect our physiques? Are there any studies related to this? Does stretching affect the hard look of muscles even though it can't change origin or insertion points? Or is the increased mobility conducive to training or to gaining more muscle through a greater range of motion? Um, so I'm not aware of any studies on flexibility uh, and muscle growth, but um, it's funny you say that because I remember probably five or six years ago, there was a style of training called FST7 uh, training where basically the idea was to really pump the muscle full of blood and then stretch it between sets. And in theory, that would kind of stretch out the fascia or like the layer that surrounds the muscle and then that would allow more nutrients and blood to get in the muscle, which would, I guess, make it grow <laughs> better. But uh, I don't think there's any research to support that. That's pretty much bro science in my opinion. Um, with that said, I would say the main benefit of being flexible or being, I would say, mobile is uh, that it's gonna allow you to perform a full range of motion effectively on basic bodybuilding movements. So how much mobility you need, I think really is specific to your sport. And when it comes to bodybuilding, you actually don't have a very high mobility requirement. So if you can reach depth on a squat, you can you know, get into position on a bent over barbell row or into a sumo stance on the deadlift, then you should be able to exercise or execute that movement through a full range of motion and that's what's gonna ultimately optimize your hypertrophy. So if you have a specific mobility detriment or deficiency, I would say to address that with specific drills, so for example, if you can't get into a wide enough position with your sumo stance on the deadlift, then you should work on uh, increasing the flexibility of your adductor muscles, uh, probably foam roll your, your hamstrings and your inner thighs before deadlifting and really make that a priority. Um, but in the absence of any specific detriment, I would say that you don't really need to kind of waste your time doing a ton of static stretching and all these mobility drills if you're able to execute the most important movements through a full range of motion effectively. So that's my thought on that. Where do you see yourself in five years career-wise and family-wise? So I actually got asked this a bunch. I was really surprised to see this um, because I do not have a good answer for this. <laughs> it's pretty crazy for me to think five years ago, there's no way I would have imagined that I'd be doing what I'm doing right now. Um, so I think it's, equally difficult for me to predict what will happen in the future. 
Um, I know that I would like to at some point branch outside of fitness a little bit. Uh, I'd love to explore some of my other interests. Like I love psychology, philosophy, um, just general science, like anatomy and physiology, um, and even more mainstream technology and whatever. So I, I could eventually see myself doing some kind of uh, channel or podcast where I do more mainstream science stuff or just general culture stuff. Uh, but I'm not too sure about that. Um, yeah, it's really hard for me to say. I mean, you guys may not know this, Steph just finished up her PhD, I think it was last year or about a year ago. So as of now, our main plans are to just like do some travel, uh, focus on our own careers and kind of see where things go from there. So yeah, really not sure, but uh, things are going really well. So definitely excited about the next five years and, and we'll see five years from now. All right, this is actually the last question. Do drop sets actually work? and what is the importance of micros, so vitamins for gains? Um, so I'm actually only gonna answer the first part of this question here, because the, the second part is gonna be really long, and I got asked that a bunch, so I'll answer that in the next Q&A. Uh, when it comes to drop sets, so uh, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld just published a, I think it was a review paper, or it might've been a systematic review last year, it might've been 2017, I'll link it in the description box below, uh, but it basically found that, you know, in my opinion, I think the evidence on drop sets have been pretty underwhelming, uh, the main effect seems to be that it's good from a time uh, or efficiency perspective. So if you're trying to get your workout in and cram a bunch of volume in, in a short period of time, drop sets are pretty good. Now I would say that there is pretty good, a pretty good mechanistic case for drop sets as well, because let's say you take a set to failure with six reps, there will still be slow twitch motor units that may not have been fully activated from that, even though you've technically reached failure. So by dropping the weight back, in theory, you'll activate a, a more full spectrum of motor units, which might lead to more growth. That hasn't been fully fleshed out in the training research, but I would still say that as an advanced athlete, I could see it being useful as an intensity technique if you use it on the right exercises. So for me personally, I do like to use drop sets from time to time, especially if I'm in a block of training that's really focused, say more so on hypertrophy, uh, metabolic stress, um, rather than say like a, a pure strength focus block. That's when you wanna apply the drop sets thing when you're, when you're doing more training to failure and, and so on. And I would reserve it for exercises like so leg extensions. I really like them on bicep preacher curls and I really like them on lateral raises because those are relatively smaller muscles that I feel like can take a little bit more of a beating and in my experience have kind of do benefit from that. Um, but I would reserve them or I would be a little bit conservative with them just because they can make your training a little bit harder to recover from. And if you do them too early in the workout, they might impede your ability to kind of accumulate volume on the heavier stuff. You wanna use discretion with them, but I do think it's good as an advanced technique tool. And I don't think I've said this yet. I might've shouted it out in my last Technique Tuesday, but uh, I am working on a follow-up series to the Technique Tuesday series, so as like a sort of spin-off. And my goal is to go through all the different advanced training techniques that you can use. So like drop sets, supersets, rest pause, forced reps, heavy negatives, all that stuff. And each one will have a separate video and you know, how you can apply it to your training in a way that actually makes sense. So I'm really excited for that because I think that a lot of people write drop sets and all that stuff off as bro science, whereas I think that they're useful training tools to kind of use when appropriate. So. Anyway, those are all the questions. I'm gonna get into the workout. Hopefully you guys enjoyed watching it. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please leave me a thumbs up and make sure you stay tuned for the next Q&A video. I'll answer the remaining eight questions. There's some fantastic questions there as well. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.